and welcome to another episode of the Inspiring Leadership Podcast, brought to you by Pursue, a bespoke leadership coaching and development company with a mission to create, nurture and develop inspiring leadership across the global education sector and beyond. My name is Nicholas Mackay, Associate Professor, Certified Professional Coach and Director of Pursue, and I'll be your host as we bring you cutting-edge leadership stories from across the world delving into the minds of recognised education and industry experts to find out about the challenges and main issues they are facing and to gain insights into inspiring leadership. In this series, we are proud to be in partnership with Independent School Management Plus and International School Magazine, the leading authority and voice for professionals in independent and international education worldwide. And if you'd like to watch the video of today's podcast, please head over to schoolmanagementplus.com. We are also supported by the Federation of British International Schools in Asia, a diverse and inclusive community of 78 leading British international schools across the Asia region. And many thanks for your continued engagement and feedback across the podcast platforms. And if you'd like to join the Pursue conversation, you can visit us on our website, pursue.com, LinkedIn and Twitter at Nicholas Mackay and Pursue. So let's get on with today's episode in which we welcome Stuart Lancaster. Stuart is a former PE teacher who is currently coaching in Dublin, Ireland with Leinster Rugby. The former head coach for the England Rugby Union team, coaching them at the 2015 Rugby World Cup, Stuart has worked at every level of rugby overseeing elite player development. Stuart, thank you so much for joining me today from Dublin. No problem, nice to be on. I'd like to see, we've got the same kit on here, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, I'm stuck <laughs> the coaching field, so... Um... You know, uh, <laughs> the worst things I could be doing on a beautiful summer's day, oh, spring day in uh, in Dublin. We've got a big game um, this weekend and then the semi-final of the European Cup against La Rochelle a week on Sunday. So plenty plenty going on over here. So how are preparations going for that? Yeah, good. No, we've got, we've had one or two lads who've been off uh, with injuries post Six Nations. So Leinster would be a team, those who don't know, it's um, it's a homegrown squad, pretty much. So a lot of players born and bred in, in, in Dublin or in the surrounding province. Um, but we we give a lot of players to Ireland, so probably 18 of our squad play in the Irish national team. And they came on the back of beating England at the end of the Six Nations. Mm. Then we went to a Pro 14 final. Um, we had a Toulon game in Europe cancelled because of COVID. But then we played Exeter Chiefs in the quarterfinal of Europe uh, away, which is a tough game, but we managed to get the win there. And um, yeah, we're now in the semi final, and um, it's exciting. You know, it's a shame the crowds aren't there, but um, it's, it's exciting. So in terms of your typical day, you said you just come off the, the training paddock. So it's about five o'clock here, UK time. So what's your day look like today, Stuart? And is, is that kind of typical of, of what you'd encounter? Um, yeah, I'd be up sort of half five-ish um, in the gym at six. Um, gym six to quarter to seven, ten to seven. Uh, I'm lucky in that the gym at UCD where we train is is the players' gym. So, you know, gyms in Ireland are still closed because of COVID at the moment. But right. um, um, so I can get in there early and train. And then uh, today we had various staff meetings and uh, coaches meetings. Uh, and then we had the senior leadership group of the players um, who were playing this weekend. We met them at nine o'clock, uh, which then led into the final sort of messaging we were giving them as coaches. And um, the final training session took place um, today. Uh, and then we had a staff meeting this afternoon. Um, and then my real focus for the rest of the day has been on preparing for tomorrow's training, which is the non-23 players who are not involved this week. Um, so I'm coaching them tomorrow morning. So I'll be preparing that tonight. And uh, a couple of one-to-ones as well, a couple of one-to-ones with players. And then I'll get back here. Obviously, we're doing this now. And then the rest of the evening will be probably FaceTime with my family. Uh, my daughter's in Northumbria doing um, psychology. Uh, my son's in Leeds doing a sports coaching degree. And my wife's in Leeds as well. And then I'll probably connect with my mum as well. So that's my day. <laughs> so it's a busy one. I'm really curious. We'll come back come back to some of the themes uh, later, hopefully, Stuart. I'm really curious about your, your senior team in your, in the rugby team and the one to one. So, what do you talk about in those meetings? In the you know the team meetings, but also the one to one. Well, it varies really. So, so the one to one today was actually with a, a player who's not been picked. Oh, okay. Um, and um, you know he's feeling obviously disappointed. He's not involved and. Um, <coughs> excuse me. He probably feels, you know, he deserves a, he deserves a chance. And, and I was just trying to reframe his mindset um, from something I would call victim into fighter mode. Um, and uh, I actually had a, some good quotes from a book that I shared with him. 
um, and I've talked about some of my own personal experience of non-selection or not getting an opportunity I felt I deserved. Um, and also tried to, yeah, just try and reframe him really into a more positive mindset. And the good thing was he listened, but a really good chat. I think he felt better for the chat. He trained really well. And there's a good chance he'll be involved in, in the upcoming weeks, you know. But the route he was going, he was, he was um, disengaging. And that's the, that's the opposite of what we needed him to do. So that was the one-to-one. Uh, the leadership group meeting of the players was more to talk about because a game of rugby is managed by the players on the field. You know, there's very little we can do as coaches. So it's given them what if scenarios. How would you deal with this situation? How would you deal with that? Um, and then uh, talking through the final plans and the final training session is me trying to exert pressure on them to test that leadership connection um, in the final training session prior to the game this weekend. So how do you exert the pressure on them, Stuart? Uh, different ways. So obviously we've got two teams of 15, 15 aside. Mm. So I can um, put them under pressure defensively or I can create scenarios where they might get a guy sin binned or some scenarios where there's, I'll give them three different um, defensive sets to do, which sometimes can happen in games and just see how they deal with the pressure of, um, deal with the pressure of, of that sort of environment. Um, sometimes we create scoreboard pressure. So um, we would, we've got a scoreboard at the training ground and we'd maybe train for 30, 40 minutes. And then I'd say, right, look at the score. And it's 24 to Leinster and 21 to Munster. And the clock is on 76 minutes. And I become the referee and I just let the game manage out. And they've got to try and manage that scenario. So it's a good way of sort of trying to um, practice, practice pressure training. I suppose you're replicating real life experiences. How do you know that that training is effective? Uh, well, I'd be massively um, a massive advocate of uh, training um, corresponding into practice um, right. in, 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 from a coaching point of view. I, I would say the same from teaching um, and, in, and in leadership as well. Um, I think four Pro 14 titles in four years, European Cup wins, but we're in fact in the European Cup semi-final. The fact that we can change the team and still achieve success. Um, I think that um, because I'm a teacher, first and foremost, I, I see myself as an educator, really. And a lot of the uh, foundation work that we do at the start of the week, and I've been here five years now, so a lot of the philosophies and the beliefs about how we play are embedded in the players. But I always use that Monday morning meeting as a chance to reinforce our philosophy, our beliefs, our standards, our expectations. Um, I'll often ask them questions to try and elicit a response from them and get them engaged in it as well. I'd sometimes talk about the vision for the future, about where we're going and why, why and how we're going to get there, um, get them excited about that. I would use lessons from other sports. I would show them clips I'd taken from YouTube or stories I'd heard. I would present leadership lessons I'd heard on podcasts. Um, and I'd constantly try and um, review our, our games from a learning perspective, win, lose or draw. And on the Tuesday, I would always recall what happens on the Monday to embed the learning, to make sure it becomes hardwired. So our on-field philosophy and our off-field philosophies, our values and behaviours have become embedded in the team. So I don't think you can achieve the success that Leinster have had uh, with so many players being away for so long with Ireland without, without that coming from somewhere. And I think it comes from our identity, our culture, but also I think it comes from the way in which we, we coach and prepare the players. It's really interesting what you said there, Stuart, because you mentioned teaching, coaching and leadership. So what are the, what's the, the kind of things that align those and what are the differences, do you think? There's a missing, there's a missing one as well called management. Because <laughs> okay. um, that's part of it, isn't it? You know, yeah, that's yeah. Certainly for me, you know, people need to understand, I think it took me a while to understand this, but I generally try and divide my, um, my role into three areas. Um, Let's call teaching and coaching the same thing. Right. Um, so teaching, let's call it coaching. Um, so coaching, leadership and management. And um, I've had roles where it's been heavy on management. So planning this week, next week, next month, logistics, and um, dealing with people, um, I don't know, doing reviews, um, et cetera, et cetera. Manage, managerial responsibilities. Leadership being the setting the vision for the future. Mm. Um, making the, the difficult decisions sometimes, um, 
setting the, the values and the behaviors that, that will drive the organization, um, creating inspirational leadership moments, uh, making people feel connected to the, to the vision. Um, and then um, uh, the, the, the coaching side of things is the day-to-day, -day, the development of the people. And so you've got the leadership management and coaching. And let's say some jobs have been heavy on management and I've probably this coaching bit's been squeezed, but the bit that really gets me out of bed in the morning that I really enjoy is the coaching and the leadership piece. I think, you know, going back to my time with England, <coughs> I think one of the lessons I learned was because I'm quite adept at the managerial stuff, you know, I'm quite well organized. And if you looked at a psychometric profile of me, you'd see I'd be quite um, detail orientated and um, I'd have a methodical way of working through emails and jobs and ticking off stuff. I, I, I'd be quite, um, yeah, yeah, decent at the managerial stuff, but at the expense of the other things, I think. So in hindsight, I wish I'd got someone, I'd delegate some more of the managerial responsibility, which would freed me up the capacity to, to lead and, and to coach. And I think probably the best analogy I can give from a teaching world, which you'd know, is you, you, you start off as a PE teacher Mm. And you love teaching, you love the lessons, you love the children and, and the, the impact you're making. Then you become the sort of deputy head of department or the head of year. And then you become a deputy head of school and pastoral and you look after timetables or exams. And then before you don't become the head teacher and all the things you were brilliant at, i.e. teaching, you're not, <laughs> not doing. Teacher, yeah. All you're doing is managing <laughs> a lot of staff and parents and pupils. Mm. And... And you're leading, obviously, a bit of peace with, you know, the, the inspirational and the organisation um, of the vision. But um, I think if I was a head teacher, I'd like to think I would really trust my deputies to take on some of that managerial responsibility and free me up time to to continue to do what my passion is, which is to teach. It's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I'm a big rugby fan. I, was, uh, I had Sarah Cox on, actually, the um, referee, a couple of weeks ago, and I was talking to her about my big love of Northampton Saints and everything else. And if you look at people who have been successful in rugby in terms of coaches, you know, Ian McGeekins, the Clive Woodwards, Graham Hendrys, Warren Gatland, yourself, you've all got a teaching background. So what is it about the teaching background do you think that makes successful rugby coaches? Well, I'm going to talk about my own personal experience, but I, I was, um, I did a sports science degree, then I did a PGC. The teacher educators at the college I was at at Carnegie up in Leeds were excellent. Mm. Their, their uh, experience and their capacity to coach me good teaching practice. I didn't realize at the time how invaluable that's been in my career. Um, so that was the foundation was strong with that. Uh, my teaching practice um, and the way in which we did micro teaching. So we were videoed. This is now what, 90, 92. Mm. I remember taking a, you know, like a year six gym session um, and it was videoed and played back to me and I discovered all the things I was doing wrong and <laughs> all the kids were running around behind my back and how you know, I lost control of the group and, and all my peers were watching as well, all the people on, on the course. Yeah. It was a pretty intimidating thing to do when you, you know, you're just learning as a teacher. Then the teaching practice, I had two uh, very different schools. I had Osset High School in, in West Yorkshire and then I had Earls Heaton High School. Earl's Heaton High School in Jewsbury, a very tough school, um, and I taught PE and geography. Right. Uh, and um, I remember this uh, year nine class had me absolutely <laughs> wrapped around their little finger. And <laughs> I thought I was doing okay, but what I didn't realise was the geography teacher was sat in the back all the whole time, as I thought, <laughs> who was going to get the copy? <laughs> and he gave me this really um, positive cr critique, but also mm. a few definite lessons learned. So that, that obviously set me up for a teaching um, career and then basically what you do as a teacher is you know you know you've got five lessons a day five days a week so you plan a session about basketball it's year seven you're going to teach them the, the chess pass the bounce pass and the layup or you're going to mm. try and develop them from not understanding the game to playing an all-court five-side game um, and you've got six weeks to do it and you've got a scheme of work and a curriculum and a, to follow and you plan do review sessions within that and then next lesson is gymnastics and the next lesson is badminton and and so on and you do that five times a day five days a week and so you you through a process of i guess the ten thousand hour rules you learn from experience you learn from feedback from either the kids or the members of the department um and you learn by your own intuition what goes well and what doesn't and i do think that ability to organize a group 
to communicate to them, to inspire, maybe devotee to people or make them feel part of something. You just do that all the time as a teacher. And mm. I loved it. You know, I really did it 40 weeks of the year. Um, and I did it from 22 to 30 years old. Um, so that was a lot of, lot of hours of getting experience that I think players who become coaches don't have. Right. They have a lot of um, what, to do, what to do in terms of like defence or attack or whatever in rugby, but they don't have very much of the how to do it and how to mm. coach it and how to communicate your messaging and how to, um, how to, get, pe to get people to learn and, and, and retain that learning so it becomes hardwired and their skills and their decision-making and their, um, their ability to work as a team becomes unconscious. And I think, I think that teaching is a, is a huge advantage for anyone wanting to go into coaching. It's that pedagogy piece, isn't it, Stuart? You know, you can have all the fantastic qualifications if you want, but if you can't get it across to people, it's useless. Yeah, yeah, and I think one of the best bits of advice I was given as a, a, a teacher going into coaching was be clear on your philosophy before you go in. So be clear on your on-field philosophy, how you see the game, um, and um, be clear on your off-field philosophy, the values and the beliefs and the way in which you want to build your team. <clears throat> and obviously that changes with time and um, you do you do flex, you do learn, you do grow, and you do change. But generally that foundation for me was strong when I entered into coaching because I guess also it's worth saying I was really helped massively by being an academy manager for five years. So by going into a coaching environment, which was less pressurized than yeah. coaching in the premiership, um, trying out things, failing, but it not being catastrophic. Um, I was on the level five course for leadership from the RFU, which was, I thought the RFU were ahead of the, the game at the time in mid, mid early 2000s. And the course was held at Ashridge Business School. So it was, a, it was nothing to do with rugby really, it was more to do with leadership and management and business principles of leadership. Mm -hmm. So that opened my eyes to emotional intelligence and different leadership styles and different learning styles and a whole raft of books that are now, well, all over there in my room. <laughs> I, uh, I would read and, you know, understand that leadership is a skill that can be learned. So that, that helped. I think um, I was put on some really good courses. Um, I was put on, uh, I was given a mentor. Um, I was put on to three or four teams where I got shadow and learn from other people. Mm. All this is in my early 30s, which then led to my first real head coaching job when I was 35, 36. And then... You know, I became the England coach at 41. So I'd gone from PE teaching at 31 to England head coach at 41, um, which is a hell of a jump. But, <laughs> yeah. but it was, I felt ready at the time because of the, the support I've been given by my mentors, by um, the RFU, um, and by all my own personal mindset to want to grow and stretch myself as a coach and a leader. Do you think it came too soon, Stuart? No, no, I don't. Um, I mean, people always remember the outcome. Mm. You know, the outcome was, was we lost a game against Wales when we were 22 12 up. Um, and I, you know, I lost my job. Um, but if you go back through the process and the, you know, the situation that I inherited, there was no CEO at the RFU when I started as head coach, there was no chairman. Um, the board was dysfunctional. There'd been a, a report leaked. Um, Martin Johnson had just resigned. Um, club and country relations that were rock bottom commercial partners were walking away yeah um, it was a very tough job to go into but I felt the improvements we made during the four years you know we won four games out of five every six nations mm. we beat New Zealand um, so we brought a lot of young players through who are now yeah. 50, 60, 70, 80 caps England players who got to a World Cup final in 2019 um, obviously that you look back you know, with things that you might do differently or things how you might have handled things differently. I don't think any leader wouldn't do that. But um, the danger of getting a job so young is that if it doesn't work out, then what do you do? Mm. That's the danger. Um, I was very lucky in that at 45, having left England, Leinster came in and offered me the opportunity to join a top European club where we've gone on to achieve, you know, great success. So I'm now 51. Um... And I still felt I've got a long way to go, but um, no, I felt ready at the time. And I felt I was, 
particularly coming from within as well. I think there's something about leadership from within an organization. I think if you read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, yeah. um, often the best leaders come from within. Uh, and I certainly felt at the time, I understood the issues. I understood what made England rugby tick. I don't think there's anyone who understood England rugby better than me at the time. Um, and I still argue I've got a pretty good understanding of it now, um, even though I've been in Ireland for five years. Because I remember at the, at the time, I mean, in the, in the media, it was like, oh, Stuart Lankers has taken a bit of a step back or step down by going into Leinster rugby after being the, kind of the, the top guy in English rugby. But I think I remember re reading, it was, I think after you left the England job, there was a lot of reflection. And I think, didn't you go and visit various teams and around the world and do a bit of travelling and just sort of get things together? I mean, what exactly did you do after that? Um, yeah, after, well, after I, leaving? I, I, I'd naturally done that anyway. So it wasn't like it was something I just did because of the World Cup. Right. You know, I would gradually, uh, generally have been very open-minded in terms of trying to grow myself as a leader by being involved in many visiting many organisations and one of the privileges of being the England head coach, you do get invited to a lot of mm. amazing events and to speak and meet great people. So I was always of that mindset. I just felt at the time in early 2016, you know, Eddie Jones had taken over. It was a new, um, new time for England. Uh, and I just needed to be, I needed some space to cut, sort of decompress and think it all through. Um, I mean, my wife and I laughed because she likes to talk problems through and I like to think problems through. <laughs> okay. And I just needed that time away. And I needed to go and share what I'd learned with other people and mm -hmm. learn from them. So, yeah, I did go to New Zealand, Australia, South Africa um, for a period of time. Um, I did a lot of coaching locally. I did, um, which was good, you know, get back on the horse, so to speak. Um, and, but ultimately, I needed another opportunity. And people said, oh, it's a step down to Leinster. I don't think, people in England, I don't think appreciate how big a, a club Leinster is, you know, in terms of like, success you know there's only mm -hmm. two to lose in europe and won the european cup four times as have leinster yeah you know? um and to win four pro 14 titles in four years where it's a knockout game at the end of the season it's not like you're winning the league um you've got to win the knockout final um takes some doing there's not many teams have done that so um and for me um it was close enough to be um away from home but close enough to get home that was important because the queensland reds job came up for example okay. um, and i was sort of thinking about that and but in brisbane my kids were 15 and 16 at the time and that family dynamic mm. has to be a part of leadership decision making when you're when you're looking at leadership roles you know what the pressure and the stress and the anxiety i put my whole family through not just my children who were what 11 and 12 when i got the england job um, and my wife who who massively committed to the role of England head coach's wife and worked hard with the wives and the girlfriends and, you know, all that work that people put in um, around me and, and support they gave me during that time. When I left, they left as well. You know, there was no thank you or no goodbye. Um, so it's tough. It's tough for my parents. So I needed, to, I needed to be close enough for them as well. So, it, you know, when we make leadership decisions, you have to think about your own family as well as your own ambition. And it's hitting that sweet spot between the two. Yeah, it's that systemic awareness, isn't it, Stuart, about different things that are going into your life. Um, and I suppose what I'm really interested in, you mentioned a couple of things with Leinster, things like identity, things like culture, which are relevant to every sector. So how do you go about building an effective identity and a, and a culture that's growth orientated or, or works for you? I think you've got to understand what what area you live in, what, um, what's the history, um, what's the backstory of the players and of the, um, the supporters mm. um, of the town, of the city, of the province, of the country. So we did a lot of work 2013. You know, the first thing I did was try and get, as Jim Collins would say, the right people on the bus, to yeah. get the right players, get the right management team, and then start driving somewhere great and... You know, the next thing became clear to me, we needed to talk about what it means to be English. You know, everyone had fought for their independence from England and from a rugby sense, if you'd lined up all the top 10 countries in the world and said, who do you most want to beat? Most countries would go, <laughs> England. Uh, and, um, and we never talked about what being English meant or, or what it means to be English and what our identity is as a country. And this is, you know, 2012, 2013, this is all, you know, people are, Brexit's coming around the corner and... Mm. We created this video um, about what it means to be English. 
Um, and it's never been seen actually publicly, which I think is a real shame in hindsight. Um, but I think it tells a great story of the, the values and behaviours of England as a country uh, and the, um, the key anchors that make England what we are. Um, and we built our, our team around, around that. And that was born out of the former players, the history of England rugby, but the history of England as a nation. And, you know, I, I didn't do it all my own, by any stretch of imagination. There's a guy called uh, Owen Eastwood who, um, he's actually got a book coming out called Belonging, which I think I would okay. recommend in, right. in, uh, in, in May. Um, and he talks a lot about the identity piece in that. He's a uh, Kiwi. And so he talks a lot about the Maori, hmm. the Maori culture. Um, a bit like Legacy, you know, James Kerr wrote. Yeah. Um, but it's, 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 it's a different slant on it. So really, I've read the draft, so I think it's definitely one I'd recommend. Um, and um, uh, so obviously, with all that learning I'd taken from the England role, I came into Leinster and, you know, this is uh, Dublin is the city centre and the province of Leinster spans 12 counties. Um, so my first sort of, it's classic first 100 days, you know, in an yeah. organisation. You're asking questions. You're learning about what school did you go to, um, uh, what, what's what's your backstory. Who tell me about your parents. Tell me about the history of Ireland. You know, I found myself very, very shallow in terms of my knowledge of Irish history, mm. um, particularly in relation to, you know, what happened with the the fight for independence and everything else. You know, and obviously the the Northern Ireland Republic of Ireland peace and everything else that goes with it. So. You know, I, it was, I needed to live in the community, be part of the community, go to the pub and chat to people in the pub and it's a good excuse anyway. It's <laughs> a hard life, Steve, isn't it? And, 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 and learn, but no, and learn and, and, and show to them that I wanted to be part of their community, mm. but also at the same time I was learning about it. And then I actually remember giving a presentation to the playing group maybe probably three months in about why I felt Leinster could be one of the best teams in the world. Um, and I, I really centred on you don't understand how strong your identity is. You know, I've been in every English premiership club, many clubs around the world. There are very, very few that have so many homegrown players. Like nine, we're talking 90, 95% yeah. of the squad. Um, and that sense of belonging that they have to their, their club, the sense of belonging that they have to their supporters and vice versa is actually something you can tangibly see and feel. Um, I think it's true in any, like, if you go back to teaching, um, sometimes we get lost in teaching on um, Ofsted reports and mm. paperwork and, yeah. and we never actually talk about our identity and what our school stands for or mm. we represent this community of Kettlethorpe in my school or whatever. Um, and I think that reason why we're all teaching together in this community is something that leadership at the top of the school needs to reinforce more often than they do. It's interesting. It sounds like you were coming in and say an outsider at in Leinster and having that view of an outsider and making things obvious to people who are actually part of the community that maybe they took for granted. Yeah, is that right? exactly. exactly. And, and, but you've got to, I had to do it in a, I don't want to do it in an arrogant yeah, way. Like, yeah. Here I am coming in from England telling you know, what, what you guys should be doing. Mm. But I've tried to do it in a way in which Listen, I've had a lot of experience in other environments and you don't realise how much you've got here mm. and how much we need to fuel this and play this. Um, because I remember um, talking about um, tri-celebrations and, you know, I'm not one for overt, you know, whatever, but I think we should also show that we care by celebrating the moments together and our fans can feed off that and then they become, feel part of it, the 16th man, so to speak. And mm. um um, it's something in COVID actually we did where uh, I was trying to think of a way to connect the fans and the players back together again because we're obviously not on the same field. And um, we created a video that we shared with the fans of our special moments, our tries. Um, uh, it was a song from uh, The Great Showman, I think, um, Coming Home. Okay. And, um, and then later in that year, well, end of last season, end of last year, uh, I wrote to the fans and supporters. What is it? What is it you love seeing when you watch Leinster play, and what is it you're looking forward to when you get back to the RDS? And there's amazing, like, powerful replies that came back that I shared with the playing group. And you know, you're in a little bubble, thinking, "Yeah, you know, I'm just doing it for my family." But there's a hell of a lot of people out there who genuinely care. And I think the more you can connect 
your vision to the wider vision. I mean, if I go back to say the England job, people have asked me, you know, what was your thought process at the time in 2012? I said, well, it was to connect the coaches to what I saw as, as the vision, mm. then the, the players and the management team, then the executive of the RFU, then the board of the RFU, then the council of the RFU, then the, um, the staff of the RFU, then the community game, um, and then ultimately doubt to the England nation about we want to be one team here and think how powerful we can be. So, you know, you use the media and various forms. It's exhausting to do it, but that's what leadership is. It's connection, isn't it? What I'm curious about, this, is there a danger here that you concentrate on getting the culture right? So, you, again, you're trying to connect all these different elements, you know, the fans, the community, the grassroots, and you kind of take your eye off the actual results. Yeah, there's a fi definitely a fine line. Definitely a fine line. But I firmly believe that you you don't get results and tag, high, and tag culture on the end. Mm. You might get it in the short term. You might, you, might, you might come in and have short term wins and you might. But if you don't look after the, the culture and identity and the organisational values um, over the long term, it'll fall apart. Definitely. Um, but yeah, there's definitely a sweet spot here between the two. You know, I think you need a strong foundation. And I guess when I came into England, I felt those were the foundations that need to be built in the first instance. Mm. You know, I think it'd be unfair to say that we took our eye off the ball, you know, to win four games out of five every six nations and, and develop the players we developed. Um, obviously, we lost a game. Again, we come back to the World Cup. We lost a game that we should have won. But, um, you know, with, with Leinster, when I came in, a lot of those foundations were already in place. Mm. So I think you can you can then start looking more towards the actual on-field performance piece as well as the off-field. And then the ultimate goal is to let the players drive it all themselves or the people in the organisation drive it. But it's a bit like a pyramid. So culture, identity, purpose, behaviours and standards, ownership, player-led leadership. That, that's that's the order I think you need to go through. If in any organisation, I would say the same. But where you devote your time depends on the maturity of the organisation, mm. depends on the current environment. I mean, you might be walking into a team that's completely broken. Yeah. Or you might be walking into an already high-performing team and you're just adding you know, 5% at the top. And you mentioned 95% of the Leinster team is, is local. So then you sprinkle that 5% on top of that and I know let's have had some Australian players and etc so how do you go about you know assimilating that as foreign influences say in a very local identity I think you recruit well so you make sure you recruit good people mm. who want to add value to the environment and uh, I think the diversity of opinion is good so I think it's a strength also to bring people in I think it seems true in, your, in the leadership team so if you look at our coaching team, Leo's from Leinster, born and bred, Leo Cullen, <coughs> who's, the head, who's the director of rugby effectively, yeah. and myself from England, uh, Felipe Contrapomi from Argentina, and Romy McBride from Wales. Mm. And I think that diversity of opinion and um, of thoughts and ideas has been a real strength of ours, and also bringing in those overseas players. Um, but, but I think Leinster are very good at judging which players will fit and which players will come for the right reasons. Um, you could probably get more money by playing in France. Yeah. You could probably yeah. get more money by playing in Japan. But would you, would your wife, would your girlfriend, would your family, you know, really feel part of a community like Leinster made me feel, my family feel? And so as a consequence, it makes it very hard to leave. Mm. You know, and that's a sign of a good culture, isn't it? You know, a sign yeah. of a good culture is good people want to come. People who are in the organisation tend to stay longer than they ordinarily would. And if they do leave, they say, that was the best time of my career. And that's probably the piece I'm in at the moment. You know, I'm five years in, just signed for another two years. And if you had said to me at the start, when I only signed for like half a season, I'd still be here seven years later. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have suggested I would, but, and the real opportunities have come up, but I'm at one of the top, top teams, top club teams in. It's a bit like, would Jurgen Klopp leave Liverpool or, you know? Perhaps he will, but I bet he find it hard to. Well, he, he's very much going up building that, as you said, that culture, the connection with the fans, as he's always said, is, you know, the, it's the 12th man, isn't it? And those European nights at Anfield, for example, it's just 
you know, wraps you up in the emotion, doesn't it? You, can, but you can't help but feel that part of, part of the reason Liverpool have struggled this season is because of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in terms of yourself, you, you've been there five years, four, four or five years. You sign up for another cu- couple. You're obviously someone who likes to engage in new ideas, go and see different things. So how are you fueling your own learning at the moment, Stuart? Um, lots of different ways, really. I mean, obviously, it is restrictive um, on in terms of travelling around and visiting, mm. physically visiting with other environments. But like this podcast here, there are hundreds of these out there if you search. Um, mm. I, I would be a strong um, reader of books and, and a note taker. Um, I'll be quite reflective. I've got a lot of time on my own, so I've got plenty of time to do it. <laughs> um, so that's helped, definitely. You know, that time for reflection and thinking. Um, Can you think I too would, much, Stuart? I mean, I would, yeah. have, I would have... I've got 17,000 connections on LinkedIn. Okay, right. Um, so I share a lot of the leadership lessons that I've learned. Mm. Um, I've got a leadership course that I've set up. Um, uh, I've done leadership modules. Um, I've done... I've worked, for, I've worked and done uh, Zoom calls, if you like, for many organisations, um, both in sports and in leadership, in the leadership world, where I feel like, you know, although I'm giving things, I always, always get something back in return. There's always something that you learn. So, um, so yeah, it's just you know, an ongoing daily process. You know, I probably didn't finish what my day would look like today. And, um, you know, once I've done this, and done the family connection piece. Um, I'm sort of halfway through Dynasty, the story of the New England Patriots. I've got mm-hmm. another book I've just bought um, that I'm going to be reading tomorrow. So that's sort of the way I'm wired, really. I guess. Bill Belichick, isn't it? New England Patriots. Yeah, Bill Belichick, the, the Patriots. Now, I wouldn't necessarily like Bill Belichick, but <laughs> I take a lot from from why were they so, so, so successful? Why Bill Walsh's book, The Score Will Take Care of Itself, was a mm-hmm. great leadership book. Uh, John Wooden, the basketball coach, you know, mm. uh, his leadership philosophy, you know, I read it, I keep thinking, geez, this is so, I'm so aligned to what he's saying here. And whether you're a basketball coach, a rugby coach, or not a coach at all, but you're in a leadership position, I'd still recommend those books to read. So do you think there's, there's a set formula, Stuart? You know, if, if, if we got you and parachuted you into a, another kind of team, obviously there's a different context, obviously there's a different identity, but do you think there's a, a formula that you could put into place that you think, yeah, you could drop me in anything, whether it's a rugby team or business, whatever, and I kind of know what to do? I'm not too sure. I, I wouldn't say it as, as, uh, as easily as that, no, because I do think the technical side of the role has a part to play. Mm. Um so, you know, if you drop me into a law firm, um, I won't be that hot on law. Um, so I do think there's elements of, you know, what are the elements of high of developing leadership credibility? Honesty, I think mm-hmm. that's transferable. Forward thinking and planning, I think that's transferable. Um, doing what you say you're going to do, I think that's transferable. But technical excellence is, is the one piece where you, if you were to go into another organization, let's say, I don't know, I went into a different sport. Mm. Um, there's definitely things, if I went into soccer, for example, or, or good coaches who I know would go into soccer or uh, hockey or whatever. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And if you drop me back into a school environment, or into a leisure, I'd have a good, have a good crack at it from what I've learned. Um, um, and that's why I think when we, when I do, you know, leadership talk to business, I do think the feedback I get is a lot of the messages that I've learned or shared are transferable, mm. definitely. But there's definitely an element of there's the technical side as well that you need to you need to get yourself up to speed on as best you can, or surround yourself with experts. I think that's what I was going to say. It's about getting the credit credibility is is a, an interesting one, isn't it? But it's also about surrounding yourself with people who potentially can do that for you. Yeah, exactly. But also, I think credibility. Um, I think the open-mindedness um, comes from the organisation as well. Now, some organisations just simply wouldn't be open-minded enough to go down this route, um, which is probably a limitation of the organisation itself. Um, but the more forward-thinking, forward-planning um, organisations who understand the value of diversity and diversity of opinion, um, they're the ones who are going to be the succeeding companies in the next 10, 20, 30 years anyway. 
Mm. Um, but I've definitely come across people I've met in the past who are fixed in that, well, I've got all the answers myself and, you know, I, I, I don't need, I don't need any more advice. Thank you very much. So, you know, I tend to move on from those people pretty quickly because that's such a limited mindset. And are you okay with people challenging you? So I suppose going back to what you're saying about your leadership team, everything else, you know, a player like Johnny Sexton, for example, very experienced, turn around going, Stuart, you got it wrong. I don't agree. Um, we yeah, said, yeah, what, we said no, what we should absolutely. be doing. I mean, certainly with a player like him who has that much experience, you know, you'd be daft not to tap into that knowledge and that experience and, and have the debate. I actually want the debate. Right. Um, because that's where you get to the truth. Um, but you have to do it in a respectful way, both ways. So, you know, um, not all conversations have to be public. You know, sometimes you can hold... Pro so if I'm to give him feedback, you know, I don't necessarily always have to do it in a public forum. Um, similarly, if he wants to give me feedback, the same. And that said, if he did it in a public forum, I wouldn't be afraid to have the conversation in front of the rest of the group um, because I think you can learn, learn a lot from that. But equally, um, some things you can take offline and, and, and debate together, but I definitely would would want that you know when when i never saw reviews of teams i was involved in as threats never never viewed it that way i always saw it as an opportunity to let's be transparent let's have a look at ourselves and let's learn and let's take what we can and move on so in terms of the line maybe between being a player and being a coach or being say a teacher or being a head or being in business and your line manager how do you or do you need that line there and how do you go about establishing it? If you're the leader? Yeah. Yeah, no, there's definitely a loneliness to leadership. There's definitely a loneliness and, and there's a, you know, there's a, there is a line, you know, and, and it's, it's probably a subconscious one. Mm. And, and the, trick, the trick for you as a leader, I think, is to walk that tightrope between, be, between being close enough to your team so they want to play for you and work for you but not so close that you can't make the difficult decisions or have a difficult conversation. Because mm. ultimately, you know, people have to be held to account and your job as the leader is to do that. Um, uh, and, you know, you're in a leadership position because you've got experience, you've got knowledge, you've got years of understanding and um, training that's helped you become that leader. Um, so, you know, you have to use that. You can't just allow standards to drop because you're not prepared to challenge people. So that does create a distance between you and the people you lead, definitely. But that's why leadership's tough, and that's why not everyone wants to do it. Now, a lot of people are very, very good managers, and I'm happy being the number two as a deputy head, and that's fine by me, and that's that's absolutely fine. You know, mm. get that balance right in your life. Um, you know, enjoy work, enjoy your family time, enjoy developing yourself and your own personal interests. But not everyone wants to be that. But some people do want to try and lead from the front and, and want to try and make a difference. And again, I'd say, you know, we need more people who are prepared to do that. Um, but there is a price to pay a little bit sometimes. Um, but if you get that balance right as well with your family and your friends and, you know, what, what, what ultimately is important to you, then I think you can reconcile like that, that in your mind as well, if you, if you really think about it. You say it's been quite tough because obviously you're on your own in Dublin and usually you'd be going backwards and forwards to Leeds, but that hasn't happened obviously for, for the last uh, wee while. So how's it been being on your own in your own space? Yeah, I'm pretty good really. Um, you know, I generally I can sort of flip between the two. You know, I enjoy company. You know, I enjoy being in, coaching the players and I enjoy, and I get that sort of, that fix, if you like, during the, during the day, you know, yeah. the games, the training, the meetings, the staff, you know, we're in an open plan office. So I get all that. Um, and then, you know, on the evenings, it's not ideal, um, but I am generally okay. I mean, I'll give you an example. We play, we play this Saturday at 7.30. And then because we've got a Sunday game next week, we actually have Sunday and Monday off mm. um, as a playing group. So, you know, if I ask you the question in reverse, if you were me in Dublin, you wake up on Sunday morning, mm. you've either won or lost the game. What would you do all day Sunday? What would you do all day Monday before everyone's back into work on Tuesday? And it's a lot of time, it you is. know. And, it is. and um, you know, you know, at home, there's probably things going on that you're not being very helpful with because you can't help because you're not there. Mm. Um, so, 
um, I try and make my days when I've got time off as productive as possible um, with either A, exercising, training, B, personal development. Um, try not to stick a box series on Netflix. And although I do, you know, occasionally you do need that downtime. Mm. Um, I tend to try and work um, uh, and prepare as best I can for the, for the week that's coming. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, but I'm no different, I guess, from a lot of people out there um, who through COVID or whatever have, have got different challenges that they didn't face maybe a year ago. Um, so I'm not complaining. Um, I can see a light at the end of the tunnel. Personally, I'm an optimist anyway. Um, but uh, um, yeah, it, it, it is what it is. So usually on the, some of these interviews, well, most of the interviews actually, Stu, I'd ask this question at the beginning but I'll ask it at the end and let, let's do things different today. So if I had to ask you to define what inspiring leadership looks like to you, what would you say? I think it would be, <coughs> excuse me, I think it would be um, create an environment where people willingly follow you, the leader, without, without, because they have to, not because they're paid to, not because they're your the land manager, but you create an inspiring leader is someone who you would willingly follow um, because of the way in which they communicate, the way in which they connect, the way in which they care about the environment, the way in which they um, think about developing you as a person and how they make you feel, um, how they care about the organisation, how their values are the same as yours and you know, they're a reflection of not just the, the individuals but also the companies as well, that, that sweet spot. Again, I think I'm lucky in that probably the way in which I was brought up is very similar from a, you know, from a farming background in Cumbria, mm. very similar to a lot of the Irish. So I think that sort of piece works as well. You know, that how you fit into the organisation. So I think, yeah, I think that's what I'd see as inspiring leadership, you know, where you, you can create that, that direction that people will willingly follow and you've got clear signposts and they know, okay, I know which way I'm going now and I'll, I'm happy to follow this person because I think they're, 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 a, good, they're a good person to try and do the right thing. That's great. Thank you so much for joining me today, Stuart. It's been really, really insightful. Um, you know, listening to all these uh, nuggets of, uh, of leadership uh, uh, information, which again are really relevant to, to education, really relevant to, to business as well as rugby as well. It's, it's it's really fascinating stuff. No, no. Thanks for the invite, and uh, yeah, hope you hope you enjoyed it. Thanks, Stuart. If you're interested in elevating your leadership practice in partnership with Pursue through our coaching and leadership development packages or would like to connect to discuss any of the topics on the show, please send me an email at hello at pursue.com or visit our website pursue.com. You can also follow me on LinkedIn and Twitter at Nicholas Mackay or Pursue. And if you enjoy the show, please leave a rating and spread the word. We are proud to be developing a truly global community. Take care and look forward to speaking to you again soon.